Thank you guys for coming to our November meeting. We have Hillary and Nick from Cold-Blooded. They are here to present a talk on Burmese pythons. Oh, Thank you very much, Kimberly. As Kim said, uh, we are Nick and Hillary. We run Cold-Blooded Pets down in Cushnet, Massachusetts. Um, we're here today to talk about Burmese pythons. Um, they're one of my favorite snakes. Uh, Nick here has been working with Burmese pythons since the shop opened about 15 years ago in 2003. I'm more of a re more recent oncomer to Burmese pythons, as this is actually Mr. Wednesday, as he'll be hanging out with me for the majority of our talk today. He was actually one of my first burns, and I've had him since he was just a baby um, And for that first year of his life, because he was so difficult, he had a lot of eye problems, I had to force feed him. And so he's become permanent stunt stunted in how he is, but he is a great snake, great educational snake. He is considered an ivory Burmese pipo, which is a super hypo when we get into genetics, which we will go over later with the rest of our mix. Anyway, so Burmese pythons are one of the world's largest snakes, with reticulated pythons being the longest, and green anacondas being the heaviest. They are distributed across Asia from Burma, of course, the name Burmese python, to Cambodia and South China. They're also invasive in parts of the United States, but we'll get to that in a little bit. As a result of the size of these animals and the size of some of the prey items, they're considered man-eaters, when frankly, they don't want to eat any human. We're too much skin and bones, we fight too much, we're not really worth their time and effort. But that's not what the media wants you to believe. The majority of the Burmese python energy is actually used for eating and digesting food so that they prefer, but they prefer more easily digested food. The majority of bites from these animals actually come from human error, such as interacting when they are in shed or becoming complacent when they are open in an enclosure. In captivity, their prey items are often rats, guinea pigs, and rabbits, but are opportunistic hunters in their lives. Are a big mouth snake that uses its exceptionally flexible skull to create an enormous gait. As a result of these modifications, the python can swallow prey four to five times the diameter of its own head. The jaws can move independently about midline of the mouth, and each bears a series of extremely sharp, recurved teeth. These are used to draw the prey using a ratchet action that alternates between the two sides of the skull. Burmese pythons are not a beginner species, and we often recommend that if a Burmese python is what you want and want to work with, that you should take you should have someone around to help you when it's time to clean cages, feed, or even take out, because anything can happen with these animals, even the friendliest ones. These animals, when they don't they want to constrict, are pure muscles, and it doesn't hurt to have a helping hand when human error gets the best of us. We also recommend that you reach out to other Burmese python keepers that you know for advice and ask if you can handle some of their snakes before purchasing one of your own. Some of these animals can weigh as much as an adult human and you need to be able to support their weight or else they're not going to be f feel secure and be nervous with you. Another thing Burmese pythons get a bad reputation for is being invasive to the United States. Yes, I told you we'd get to it. <laughs> While we agree that invasive species need to be handled and removed from the environment to which they don't belong so native species can thrive, there's no reason to demonize Burmese pythons to the length that they are reported on. This is especially true when there's other factors at play in the Everglades, such like pollution from big sugar or feral cats. But cats are fuzzy and loved, and so they don't catch the headlines like, man catches 20-foot snake in the Everglades, or the snake that's eating the Everglades, eating the rather than feral cats are killing a billion birds a year and responsible for the extinction of several bird species. But that's besides the point. A lot of these sens sensationalist news stations don't report on things that are really issues to these reptiles, like the fact that they are ectothermic and cannot regulate their internal body temperatures like mammals. Anything lower than 70 degrees for an extended period of time will kill them, which means that they cannot survive in the wild of the majority of the United States. However, with concerns of global warming, there is fears that they could make their way to more and more northern states over the next few decades if temperature highs continue. <laughs> a plus helper. Woo! <laughs> now we can all argue about how Burmese pythons came to the Everglades while animal rights group believe that they were abandoned pets, which feeds into their narrative of ending all pet ownership. 
Most agrees that it came to be a problem in the Everglades after Hurricane Andrew in 1992, which destroyed a breeding facility. Because they are invasive, in 2012, Burmese pythons were added to the Lacey Act, which prevented Burmese pythons from being transported into the country as well as state lines. The Lacey Act, if you've never heard about it before, is a 1900s United States law that bans trafficking of illegal wildlife. In 2008, the Act was amended to include plants and plant products such as timber and paper. In 2012, Burmese pythons, and most recently in 2015, reticulated pythons, African rock pythons, and yellow and green anacondas. All illegal in Massachusetts. <laughs> Thankfully, interstate transport ban was struck down in the United States thanks to USR, the United States Association of Reptile Keepers. But they are still legal to import into the United States. Now that we've gotten over the general talk and my general anxiety, <laughs> let's meet some of these snakes. Nick is going to take them out and tell you a little bit about them, from their color to pattern morph, their age, their current diet, and of course, what we've named them. So this guy is Gimli. Um, I brought him mainly because he's the only the semi-normal wild pattern. Um, he's actually 100% dwarf. He's two years old. Um, he's feeding on frozen thoughts, small rats at the moment. And as you can see, this is what they generally look like in the wild. Um, nice dark colors to blend in fairly easily. I was going to go around with him. I'm not going to pass him around because he can sometimes have an attitude. I was actually going to ask, is that typical of the dwarf? It is typical of the dwarfs. Um, he's, usually, he's usually great when he's out, um, but he is very cage aggressive. Um, I can't see anything physical that makes him look like a dwarf. Uh, his mom is 12 years old and only 8 feet. His dad is uh, 10 years old and only 4 feet. Wow. Is it because they're an island? Yeah, it's different, if it's different locales from wild caught animals. Um, and there's not a whole lot of 100% dwarf berms. You know, in the tree, I heard because of the attitude. Yes, most people don't want dwarf stuff because they tend to be angry. Do you um, think it could be a polymorphic that we could size down just from regular size? Uh, yes, that's what a lot of people do. You'll see a lot of 50% um, dwarfs out there, because um, he will breed with an average size bird. Um, and then you can have you know, albinos and other dwarfs that stay smaller and more manageable for pets. The problem is, a lot of times they get the dwarf attitude. So while you will have, you know, a nine foot albino berm, it may try to kill you every time you open the drop. Yeah. Or tope or whatever you're keeping it in. That's not fun. <laughs> but he's actually being really good today. Mm -hmm. right. oh, yeah. um, before I keep going, I want to mention most of my snakes were in shed today. Um, of the 20 or so berms we have, two were not in shed. <laughs> <laughs> um, so some of these don't look as you know, vibrant as they may otherwise look. But we work with our snakes on a regular basis. One of the things that we really focus on when we get them from a baby all the way to adulthood is hook training them. Mm -hmm. So when we go into the enclosure, we use a hook to basically tap them to say, it's not feeding day, you're coming out. Otherwise, you know, sometimes they're all teeth and mouth and leading to those typical cave aggression schemes. So this girl right here, <laughs> She is 18 months old. She is in shed, as you can see. <laughs> um, I actually have her mom, her sister, and her dad here with me today that you'll see in a little while. So she is technically a normal, but as you can see, she looks much different from the other one. Um, a lot of it has to do with the recessive genes that are in play. Um, some people call them visual hets. So she actually is het green, het albino, het labyrinth, possible het caramel. So she's got a lot of interesting patterns, but just this just to give you an idea of what you know a snake is can be at about 18 months old. Um, she's a girl, they get you know slightly large, well, pretty big, pretty big compared to the boys, but they grow much faster. 
Now she's eating frozen thawed guinea pigs at the moment, and I'll show you her sister in a little while who's only eating live, so she's eating smaller prey, and you'll, you'll notice she's about half the size of this one. Um, so this girl's name is Maya, and she's a big puppy dog. Even in full shed, her eyes are perfectly blue, <laughs> and normally she's like a nice golden color, but today she is very, very, very faded. But she's, yeah, she's just a baby. And a lot of people think that she was green when she was a baby because of her colors and her patterns. Um, green berms tend to have a lot of these spots on them. But that, again, that's one of just the visual heads coming through. As you can see, she's got quite a unique color to her. Um, I think part of it is the het caramel coming through. Because uh, as, like, as you'll see when I show out her mom, her colors are way different. Her sides are crazy. Yes. Wow. And when she was born, her sides were actually solid white all the way up to this pattern. Oh. But as she's getting older, her colors are changing a little bit. But her pattern is pretty much staying the same. And this girl was born not this past June, but the June before. He's not very big and he's in a six foot vision and he still just constantly rubs and rubs and rubs. But, so, you know, uh, this guy is about 12 years old. He is in full shed, that's why his colors are so faded like they are. You'll notice his eyes are getting blue and cloudy. And this is the dad to the last two that I just showed you guys. So is he more active than they usually are where he's rubbing so much? Or is he yeah, he playing? likes to breed with everything, so he's constantly <laughs> looking for girls year-round. Um, he never really stops. I could put him with... Yeah, I could put him with anything, any time of year, and he will try to breed with it. And how does he eat in, when in that mentality? He is a very picky eater, um, which is part of the reason why he's so small. Um, he mostly wants to breed, so he only eats maybe once every three weeks, he'll accept food. That's 
it's we've got males just like yes. that. that if there's a female in yeah, the room, he, it's the end of the. End yeah, of the he's story. he's more interested in the ladies than he is food most of the time. As you can see, you know, like I said, most animals are in shed right now. different than her daughter's, mm -hmm. as well as the pattern. She has the normal pattern of a regular Burmese wild caught, but her colors are much, much prettier. She's another one that's usually super cage aggressive, but when she's out, she's a big puppy dog. Um, for instance, when I took her out today, she tried to attack me through her cage. <laughs> um, but she's a big baby. What's she weigh? Huh? What's she weigh? Um, 35, 40 pounds? Yeah. Yeah, she used to go to the gym when you had big snakes. Yeah. Yeah, she is a big puppy dog. This is what your average hypo usually looks like. Look at the gray and blue on her side. Yeah, she is gorgeous. Her tail's out under the... Yeah, I see it. <laughs> I was just trying to make it so it didn't grab the camera. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I know. Her name is Audrey, by the way. Yes. Named after Audrey Hepburn because she's just as gorgeous. <laughs> yes, she is Audrey. She eats uh, about a five pound rabbit every other week. She's a little too big. Alright, so now that you've seen the family, <laughs> up next we have one of my retired breeders. This guy hasn't bred in a few years for us, but we still like to take him out every now and then because he doesn't get so much love now that he doesn't breed. <laughs> So he's an albino. As you can see, he's also in shed because he's nice and faded. And... Uh, he's like soaking. Yeah. And this guy's actually pretty big for a breeder-sized boy. Mm. Um, as you saw by the other albino green, who was maybe half his size. Um, when I originally bought him uh, 12 years ago, he was sold to me as a female. <laughs> so I tried to put him in with another uh, male, and then there was issues. <laughs> Males will fight, and a lot of times one of them doesn't make it through. Yeah. Um, whether it be um, due to infection from wounds or just outright, sometimes they actually will actually strangle each other. Um, I had uh, probably about 10 years ago, I had a big green female who actually killed one of my albino green males. Um, so it is. I, I try to tell people it is something that does happen when breeding. Snakes don't always get along, and sometimes there's nothing you can do about it. So I always try to stress to people that you don't want to breed your pets because something can happen. Um, now, while this guy is, you know, a pet now, it is possible that things happen to males as well as females. Females can get egg bound. Um, males usually, if something happens, be it's because of the female, she'll, you know, attack him, or in the off cases that sometimes you put two males together, because, you know, you don't check yourself, and you, know, you take somebody else's word that, you know, oh, I bought a female, so it must be a female. Sometimes it's not always the case, whether it be through, um, you know, a, a, an honest mistake, 
someone just missexed it when they sold it to you, or they know females are more desirable, and sometimes they go, this is a female, you should buy it. Because everyone wants the girls, because they get huge. <laughs> and this is why we stress having two people around? Yes. Because oh, even a small one like this is sometimes a pain in the butt to get back. Super hypos look like. Yeah, the only the only downside to the pearls is when they get older, they typically start to turn more light in color, and a lot of people it's really hard to tell the adults from a normal albino. Aside from the eye color. person um, and then she was not doing so hot so then we got her. At her heaviest Roxy was 210 pounds. Um, when we got her she was down to 90 pounds um, and we have gotten her back up. She's roughly about 100 to 120 pounds right now. Um, she is eating 10 pound rabbits every week. <laughs> um, another thing to notice is sometimes you can hear her wheezing Big snakes like this have a really small trachea. So when they're getting really heavy bodied, a lot of times people think they're hissing, but they're actually wheezing. Kind of like if you were to try to breathe through a straw. Mm -hmm. It's not easy for them to breathe, breathe when they're out like this. So generally, we always recommend multiple people to help spread out the weight. Um, also, well, um, when people want to come see her, I'm actually gonna put her on the floor, make it a little easier for her to breathe. So while she may sound mean, I can assure you she is definitely not. <laughs> but also have you know that when Roxy wants to go someplace and she's out, there's it's, no stopping. It's very hard to stop her from doing what she wants to do. 
Um, again, you can see she's you know full shed. Uh, normally her colors are a bright gold and a brown. Um, and uh, that's it. This is a big girl. Um, they do get larger. I have seen some larger ones, but she is the biggest one in our collection. Uh, her last clutch of eggs was actually 52 eggs. <laughs> uh, to give you some sort of perspective, um, Audrey, the hypo, her last clutch was 20. <laughs> All right. All right, let's put her down. Yep. Thank you. <laughs> here, hold back up this way. Christine, can you move this table? I'm just going to put her on the floor right here. There we go. All right. That is... The Burmese Python. The Burmese Python talk. If anyone wants to come up and uh, say hi to Roxy, feel free. <laughs>